Hi, welcome to the October uh, Java user groups for uh, Kansas City. Uh, today's talk topic is uh, My JVM is Doomed by Jen uh, Monterubio. Um, again, welcome to Kansas City Java user group. And we'd like to thank our sponsors, um, uh, CRL was sponsoring the uh, um, StreamYard, which is what we use to uh, distribute video. And if we ever uh, go back to in person, we'll go to YRC Freight's uh, location. Um, and YRC Freight's is uh, going to be moving, so they'll be in the uh, Sprint Bowl campus. Java news for the month. Uh, JDK 17 was released. It includes uh, sealed classes. Uh, allows to allows a class to define its own allowed subclass. Um, strongly encapsulates JDK internals. Um, uh, illegal access permit is now a no op, and uh, Sun miscellaneous unsafe and other key APIs are unavailable. Um, you can still add, define add opens for for reflection uh, if needed. Um, and another big change with um, with Java 17 JDK 17. Oracle is proposing to move to an LTS uh, uh, release every two years instead of uh, what it was before. And there's uh, a link there. And also a new licensing model from Oracle. So before, uh, when Java 9 came out, they announced a new licensing model. Um, it, and it seems like uh, Java 17 and going forward will be free. So that's a huge deal for, uh, for Java, Java guys. Releases, um, we have Spring 6 and Spring Boot 3 will be in Java 17 native. And uh, Jen mentioned that um, Hibernate 5.6 was also released and it, it is also native. So some big moves in the, um, in the uh, Java space. Um, conferences, um, we got the uh, 2021 JConf Dev and it's virtual. Uh, it, it has a virtual conference and it'll be December 8th through the 10th. Um, no Kansas City meetup uh, for November and December. We're going to enjoy the holidays. And so this will be the last one for 2021. Um, doo -doo -doo. So again, to get involved, attend the meetups, um, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, suggest topics, speakers, locations, and there's a link to volunteer to speak. If you follow us on Twitter at, at Casey Jug and provide us feedback with that lovely uh, URL. And I think that's it. So we'll bring Jan on. So oh, hello. Hello. So we'll introduce you. Hi. Yeah. There you awesome. go. So hi, everybody. My name is Jan Monterubio. Um, this is my JVM is doomed. It'll be a talk about very intro things to the world of heap analysis. Um, ooh, let me switch my screen. There we go. Cool. So I still have you guys. So who am I? I'm Jan. Usually at work, I will work on backend services, so mostly Java, and then I'll also dabble with Groovy and crazy Jenkins Groovy. Um, for my free time, I like to play games, and I also maintain an open source language called DogeScript. So this um, talk will be a little bit um, workshoppy with comments, but we can't really interact in person, so I won't have you do everything. I'll just showcase what I'm doing. So I'll give a little high level on what the services I'm gonna spin up and what I'm gonna do are. And while the tests run to send traffic, I'll give a quick background on a couple of heap concepts, you now things move through the heap. And then I'll go through three open source tools that help with heap analysis. Um, and I like to do these in a transition of what I think is easiest to what I think is a little bit like more power user level. And depending on how late it is and like if we're all hungry or not, I might show you guys how to do a JFR profiling. If not, maybe I'll come back and do that at a different instance. So the um, intention or the purpose of this course is to sort of give you a crash course on what we're doing. We also created a website called jvmperf.net. 
where you can get a lot of the content that I'm going to show here. Some content on profiling, some content on GC logs, some content on some container tools now that we're moving to the world of containers. We created this website since we used to teach this course at Cerner. It was called um, Heap Analysis Intro. And we found that there wasn't that much like open source content around this. There's a lot of info scattered around in each individual tool, but we never found like one YouTube channel just for like Heap Analysis like you would when you look for Kubernetes info. So we created a website, we update it frequently, and you can get all the info you want and a workshop that you walk through on your own with examples and explanations. So the setup for the demo that I'm gonna show is something like this. We have a service, which will be in purple. It is a drop wizard based service. It has a couple of resources, but the one we're gonna interact with most is a query resource to find conference info. Um, the conference info was sourced from KCDC um, since this initial workshop was given to KCDC in 2015. So we're gonna get the info back from them. However, as time evolves and you know websites change, KCDC no longer returns the information that we want. So for that, we're going to mock it using a open source tool called Wiremock, which we'll talk about a little bit. And also a benefit of using Wiremock is when we do the workshop at Cerner, we're not unintentionally denial of servicing them by sending like 10,000 requests for 30 people in like a span of five minutes. So they don't block our IP. And in order to send a traffic, we're just gonna use Gatling, which is another open source tool to sort of send HTTP traffic. So, Wiremock, um, if you're not familiar with it, Wiremock is a mock service. That's a very neat feature where you can actually proxy things. So what I've used it for is to proxy a service that my service depended on, capture all the requests and replies, and then I can turn around and make my integration tests depend on the can responses instead of an actual third, like third party service or a service that I don't actually control. It also helps you test scenarios where you can't actually make the third party service throw a 500 error because you don't control it. So with Wiremock, you pretend that the service throws a 500 and then you try like your circuit breaker configuration and all that stuff. The next tool I will be using is Gatling. Gatling is a load testing tool. It is written in Scala and it provides a Scala-based DSL, uh, domain-specific language, it's to sort of define a scenario in terms of users. So 10 users open app at this time, 25 users show up in the next 30 seconds style of language. And through the course of searching for heap analysis and like information and knowledge, I also ran into this app that the white crash um, product uh, put out, which is the buggy app. It also has examples on how to make a, or like get a heap dump, how to have a memory leak in your process, a thread deadlock. So they made an app where you just press different actions and it'll show you a JVM problem. And then you can use the tooling that we're talking about here to look at how that actually looks in the tools. Um, the White Crash product is also the owner of a couple of tools. One of them would be GCEC, if you're familiar with it. They are really good for like parsing GC logs. They also have FastThread, which I haven't interacted with. And they have Heap Hero, which you upload a heap dump and then they do heap analysis, which to me sounds scary because there's a whole bunch of information in the heap dump. So if you are gonna do it, don't unintentionally send any proprietary data. Awesome, so before I get to the background concepts, I'm going to switch to my terminals and hope this looks fine. So I'm gonna start my server. I'm going to... Can you make that any uh, larger? Yeah. How's that? Big enough? I think so. Cool. Mm -hmm. like that. Start my wire mock service, and then I'm gonna make this. And I'm just gonna let Gatling um, shoot requests at the service while I talk. So we have our workshop service, it's in drop wizard, so we get nice ASCII. Wire mock, again, nice ASCII. And then um, Gatling is just gonna compile Scala and start sending requests. So I'll send about 17,000 requests while I talk, and hopefully my CPU can handle the stream and everything. Okay, back to our concepts. So since I try to phrase this as a course of I don't know anything about the heap, I'm gonna talk a little bit of intro level stuff. So 
In order to define what garbage is, and to understand the heap, we need a definition of what is garbage. So a dead object is garbage. For the JVM, a dead object is an object that no longer has references pointing to it from a GC root. So in a method, if you create a new array list, do something with it, don't return it, and just the method exits, that array list only lives for the life of the method, and it can then be garbage collected later. The VM we're going to talk about here is Oracle's VM, which is the hotspot VM. And they have a premise called the heap, the weak generational hypothesis. Now, in order to keep in line with the theme of October and spooky, I decided to go with Pokemon to represent objects. So these are Ghost Pokemon, Ghastly, Haunter, and Gengar at the bottom. And I feel like Pokemon represent a nice transition into evolving, getting experience, becoming tenured, and being a little bit more expensive and hurtful to get rid of the longer they've lived. So now onto the first premise of the weak generational hypothesis. Most objects die young. So what we mean with most objects is stuff like new array list, new string, and all that stuff. A lot of things that you're doing just for computation don't end up past the method. And the second premise of that is since most objects die young, few old objects reference young objects. If you think of a term of like an old object would be something like a cache. The longer the cache lives, the longer items in the cache live, so they're both getting older as time passes. Now let's talk a little about the memory layout of the Java of Java process. Usually, as an application developer, I've mostly ever concerned myself with the gray box, which is the heap. I set my XMX, my XMS, and I ship it to production, and boom, it should all work. Now, however, now that we're moving into a container-based deployment system, we not, need to not only care about the heap, but also all of the memory allocated to the Java process. So in order to visualize that, the Java process, at least in Java 8, has additional parts of memory on the right. The meta space is where your classes get generated. This used to be the perm gen area. So if you ever had a Maven error that like you couldn't allocate perm gen because Surefire, like that's where all that lives. And also have thread stack frames, which is the, th the size of your thread stack. Um, I believe the default is a megabyte. So if you're making a lot of threads, you have a whole bunch of memory that is allocated to your thread stack. And if you're not really going that deep on your stack, you can actually decrease the size of the thread stack and overall decrease the size of like your whole container or your pod. We also have native memory. In terms of the heap, we have two main regions. So the young generation, which is where a lot of our minor garbage collections will happen, and the old generation, which is also the tenured area. So let's zoom in a little bit on the heap and talk a little bit about how objects move through. So our objects get allocated into the Eden, which is where everything new gets allocated. We fill up our Eden, a minor GC happens, we pause the application a little bit to compute what needs to be discarded. And we decide three things can be discarded, and this other object still has references, so we're going to move them into the survivor space, which is S0 and S1. And they keep two regions of memory of the same size to do something super neat that we'll see in a little bit. So we continue creating objects. We fill up our eating again. We're going to promote things. So since we already have something in the two survivor space, we're going to actually promote them. And we're going to switch the pointers on the regions to denote what survived and what needs to like transition. And then we're going to transition our survivor into the two survivor space just to keep him again. But now he's a little bit evolved. And then we're going to move the new objects there. And we'll continue doing this until we fill up the regions. Then once again, we go, we fill up our Eden. We want to move things into two survivor, but now we're out of space. So we're going to promote our hunter into a Gengar. Now he's more expensive. He's in the tenured region, so he's harder to get rid of. And we're going to move our objects around. And we'll keep doing this until we run out of memory or we end the lifetime of the JVM. So now I'm going to move back to my terminal and hope it all finished. That was not finished because I went a little bit too quick. Um, but are there any questions while this waits? If not, I can kill it. Awesome. So the first thing, yes. I got a question. Yeah. Um, I know there were some changes between JDK 8 and JDK 9 yes. um, with how they uh, dealt with like permgen. Is that, yes. is that graph uh, 9 and above or is that? Java I or... believe the graph is eight and above went from Perngen to Metaspace, and they like combined a, co a couple of regions. 
they're getting like crazier with like G1 GC and zero GC. And like, that's like too much for me sometimes. <laughs> so especially since we just do Java 8 at Cerner, like I deal mostly with Java 8 for now. All right. Is this representational of the G1 GC or it's representational of the parallel GC branding? Uh, G1 GC, you can think about the same thing, but happening in a grid of uh, 1024 by 1024 regions of memory. Um, cool. I will continue. Awesome. So while that finishes, let's talk a little bit about how do you acquire a heap dump? And what I tell people when I give this course is, Usually you, you don't go looking for heap dumps. The heap dumps come to you when everything is crashed and you need to be reactive. But we're gonna be a little bit proactive and acquire our heap dump. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find our Java processes. I could use top if I wanted to, but Java actually has some nice tooling around this. So the first tool you can remember is JPS, which is the Java processing um, system. JPS will show you all the Java processes running. It is itself a Java process, so it usually shows up and it shows you the name of the jar. Now, if I had to name my jar something nice and I wanna figure out what exactly is running, I could use JPS minus L, which gives me the like full name of the executable that I ran. If that's not enough information, I can use M to show the arguments passed to the JVM. So in my case of the service that I care about, so a drop wizard service. So if you're familiar with drop wizard, these two arguments make sense, it's a server and passing the YAML file. And if I still don't have enough information, I can use LVM for um, V for the virtual, or for the Java virtual machines arguments. So here's everything passed to the JVMs. And it's kind of a little bit messy because I have a lot of processes happening. But if I had set XMX or any other properties, you would see them here. Now, JPS eventually got moved to another tool called JCommand, as well as other tools like JStack and JMAP. The Java tooling had a problem where if you needed to do something, you had to know the name of the tool. Um, so if you wanted to do stack traces, you need to know to use JStack or JMAP to do heap dumps. So they try to solve that with JCommand. JCommand is another tool that comes with the JDK. Um, the first time you run it, it's pretty much like JPS. So it'll show you processes. And I believe this is the LM arguments. And it's a little bit quirky to use because if you try to get help for it, um, it'll tell you that you need a process ID first in order to know what you're doing. And that is because different VMs will let you execute different commands. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use jcommand command to grab my process and we'll remember and see help. And this is all the commands we can actually run on this JVM. Um, they look, the invocation will look a lot like invoking a static method in a static class. And I believe this is how they're doing it kind of like how mbeans does it. So the first one I'm gonna show you is we're gonna actually use start.print to print the stack trace. And this will give me a threat dump of everything that's happening. This is pretty useful if your service is stuck and you think there's a deadlock, you can do a threat dump, pass it to a file and then search for anything that's running or anything that's blocked and do a count of block threads. Um, and it's helped me to figure out like a Jenkins instance that was actually blocked and we just had to restart it. The other commands, actually I'll just I'll do them again just so we have them fresh. The other command that I found useful is the system properties. And this will show you obviously all the system properties, but this is pretty nice and useful when you're passing encoding or other configuration through system properties. So you can at a quick glance know what's happening. You can also tell the type or the JDK version or the class version. How do you run this commands in a remote JVM? That is a great question. I haven't done it in a remote JVM. I would usually exec, like exec into it. So if I was doing this in kube, I would launch a Kubernetes pod or do a kubectl exec IT and then get into the container in the pod. Um, there are UI tools like JConsole that you can use to attach to the JVM and then like run them through a GUI. So I can try that um, once I move on. So yeah, if you can keep it highlighted somehow. I'll, I'll remember, I'll try to remember to show that to you. Now, the last command, we're gonna get a heat dump. 
which is gc.heapdom. And there's like a whole bunch of others. I could start a flight recording if I wanted to. And the next argument I'm going to give it is the name of the heap dump. So I'm just going to call this one dog.hprop. And that'll generate a heap dump of my process. And then if you're in a container, you can then copy that out and inspect it. So now, while that goes, let me see if, awesome, my Gatling finished. Um, if you're not familiar with Gatling, let me show you what that looks like. So Gatling will give me a report of all the requests that I sent, the execution time, a percentile. So if you have a service that is actually performing great, you'll see no chaos. If it's completely doing horrible, you'll see a whole bunch of percentage of chaos, which is uh, 400 or 500 errors. So, and you'll see the time of, that things are taking just go like way above the, uh, the throughput here. You can also break down the requests by um, resource, and then it gives you a little more detailed um, distribution on how long something took. So you could diagnose a resource that's not performing as well. Cool. So now let me move on to the heap dump. So now um, I used to tell this joke during the course. It's like, well, how do you look at the heap dump? Well, you just use the cat command and you look at the heap dump and you start like analyzing like that. And if you're ever bored out of Starbucks, this is great to do while you leave your laptop open. People think you're like hacking into the Pentagon and they'll leave you alone. So now let's start looking at our heap dump. Where I'm going to start is I'm going to approach this as a I have no idea what's going on in here. So for that, I'm going to use the J overflow plugin, um, which comes with JDK mission control. I already installed it, but you have to install it just like you would in Eclipse with help, install new software, and then you can find the plugin. So I'm going to do is J overflow will also let me um, select something in Java Mission Control. This is the JVM browser. I don't know if I can make that bigger. Let me see. Probably can't. So hopefully that's not super terrible to see on the stream. Um, Casey Jug, is it an IntelliJ? I believe uh, you can get an IntelliJ plugin for it. So J overflow will actually let you perform a heap dump through the UI. Um, so once you'll see it like perform over here and it'll eventually open up to what I think is one of the nicer looking and friendlier looking UIs um, compared to the other tools because this has pie charts and colors. Um, and while it opens, I'm gonna take a sip. Awesome, so this is J Overflow. J Overflow was created by the team that created the J Rocket JVM. Um, Java Flight Recorder still uses the J Rocket logo, which we'll see here. Um, the J Rocket team was developing their own JVM, and in order to diagnose their JVM, they built a tool on their JVM to diagnose their JVM, which is kind of crazy to me. So Oracle saw that it was a great thing, and they saw a competing JVM and decided to acquire them and keep part of their tooling. Since they were rocket themed, that's why this is called Java Flight Recorder and so has the rocket icon. And if you install the plugin, the package on it used to be com.jrocket and they finally renamed it to com.oracle to take ownership of it. Um, J Overflow, when they developed the plugin, they developed it in a sense of, through their analysis, what is the most common problems they had seen with JVMs? So they decided to split things into what they called anti-patterns, which are these. Um, the anti-patterns have definitions and you can find them and they're scattered around the internet, but we've put all of the definitions on our jvmperf.net website. So you can figure out what those are. So common patterns, um, like one of the like obvious ones is duplicate strings. Since I'm not running with J1GC, every time I create a string, um, it's going to create a duplicate. So a quick, way to tackle performance problems would be to look at these patterns and see if there's something that's completely terrible. Um, an example of this that I've experienced is I opened up a heap dump and there was a long zero tail array, which I'll explain in a little bit, that was 64 megabytes of my heap. So that was one instance that was 64 megabytes where 
3,000 of the characters in the 64 million array had content and everything else was null characters. So I was like an immediate, oh man, we have a problem here. We need to go figure out how this array came in, who sent us this, and we were able to diagnose it and patch it up. So the problem that happened there is we had a front end sending us um, the whole editor and they allocated their editor to be 64 million characters, like the maximum we could take, and they just sent the whole editor array instead of trimming the content and sending it to us. So on our receiving end, it would just like did a trim to like try to immediately eliminate the memory and keep um, going on. So a long zero tail array, the definition is, if you have an array of 10 and you've only actually filled three items or less than half, you're wasting the tail of the array. So that's why it's called long zero tail. Um, you'll see a bunch of instances of this when you're creating like new array list and you're just adding like one item to the array list. Oh, awesome, somebody zoom in for me. That's great, thank you. So you'll, you'll see an instance of this when somebody creates like a bunch of array lists and fills one item. Um, the same thing happens with other types of collections. The other big pattern, um, which I don't consider usually is arrays of size zero. If you do like new int array zero, you're still paying the cost for the size of the pointer. And even though you're like, ah, oh, it's like whatever, like four bytes or 12 bytes per array, in conjunction, all of these end up adding up. Um, in terms of J overflow, hopefully it's like updating quickly. Um, so I'm going to start with the all objects view. Usually if something sticks out, if there was like something super big, I would click on that anti-pattern, like duplicate strings and drill down. But since nothing is sticking out at me, it's just like, well, I don't know, like 40% of the heap is things I could go attack, but where's the rest? Where's like that 60%? So what I'm gonna do is I'll select the all objects and then I'll go down to my classes. And in my classes view, I can see that I have 70% of my memory is being used by the search result elements. Awesome, thank you for zooming in. And um, I have about 2.5 million, like 2.7 million objects of that instance. Well, I'm returning conference data and like we're hitting it with a lot of traffic. So that might seem reasonable at the moment. So what I can do in J overflow is I can click on something to filter the view, um, which I'll have Justin zoom out a little bit there. So I'll filter the view and that basically filters the whole UI into the context of all objects and things in this package, this class type that I picked. And in the refer pane, I can then analyze what is holding on, where are all of these objects coming from? So in this case, GeoOverflow is telling me like, hey, all of these objects are being referenced by this clever cache. I'm like, okay, well, I have a cache on my service. That's how we're so fast. So that might seem normal to me. And this is where a little bit of domain knowledge applies. In your services, maybe a 20 megabyte Hibernate cache might seem normal and the common thing to have. So you don't consider that a problem, but somebody approaching this from a new angle might see, oh, 20 megabytes of Hibernate, like this is the problem, we need to get rid of this. So when you're doing this analysis, a lot of it is very context specific on what you, the owner of the service consider normal versus not. So you'll start seeing things that stick out like, Hold on a second. I don't remember like adding Hibernate to my service at all. What's happening here? Um, a kind of quirky thing about J overflow is if I wanted to go back and dig through something, you would think that the back button does it, but the back button actually erases and like resets the whole state. So when you're digging through J overflow for things, I usually like to like keep track in my head of like the steps that I've took just to go back and like refilter. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pick the duplicate strings and I'll pick this regular session. And now that I have this filtered out, um, one of the things that I usually complain about the tool was like, well, I want to see what these objects are. Like, what is this class? So I'm going to zoom back to our 2 million objects. So if I wanted to see what does this actual class look like, um, J Overflow has an option to do that, but they hide it from you. So in order to inspect it, you have to go window show view and then stick down to the J overflow and open up the instances view. They also added, added a tree map in JDK 
Mission Control 8, which I haven't played with, so I'm not going to show you because I don't understand it. So the instances view will give you the instances of everything that you currently have filtered and applying to. I believe they hide this because it's actually like filtering the memory and it's also memory expensive. So if you have a array of 64 megabytes and you try to open that, it'll crash the application. But what I can do with this is I can inspect a particular instance and see my what my objects have. And I have like ASCII art here. So apparently I'm sending ASCII art to these conferences and I'm sending them back to the UI somehow. What is the difference between mission control and visual VM? All right, so mission control is a, they look, yes, they look almost the same. I believe their mission control is now built on the Eclipse tool set and visual VM is built on top of the NetBeans tool set. Um, mission control is a tool provided by Oracle that both has profiling aspects to it. And it's the only tool that supports JFR visualization at the moment, Java Fly recording. And Visual VM, I consider a more general, both profiling and heap analysis tool. And they also have a plugin for like database queries. So we'll get to Visual VM in a little bit. So that is J Overflow. Um, any questions before I move on? So J Overflow told us there's 2 million of these. That might seem normal to me, um, but we'll keep it in the back of our head. Like that seems like a lot of objects. Cool. Now that we kind of have an idea of what to target in J Overflow, we will move on to the next tool, which is Eclipse Map. Um, Eclipse Map is um, a plugin for Eclipse, or you can also just download the Eclipse Map application on its own. I usually like to download the application on its own. If you do use Eclipse and you install the plugin, the one benefit is when you're analyzing things, you can actually go to the sources of jars if you have your code checked out in the same workspace in Eclipse. So I'm going to go, I'm going to open our heat dump that we generated a little bit ago. Kissy jug. And we're going to let that churn for a little bit. Um, which is a good time for a liquid break. And if you're paying attention to the JDK uh, mission control one, this almost looks the same. So um, I personally don't open any of the reports, but I'm gonna open the leak suspects report right now to give you a word of caution once it opens. So. The definition of a suspect is somebody you believe to be guilty of something, but it might not be. Um, in a lot of police shows, usually the suspect is like the boyfriend, and at the end of the show, it ends up not being the boyfriend, but the crazy neighbor. So not jumping to conclusions is good. Um, if you've never done an analysis before and you opened up the um, leaked suspects, you might immediately jump to the biggest slice of the pie, say, oh, well, the problem is the instrument handler Let's just get rid of drop wizard metrics and we're good to go. Um, and that might not actually solve your problem. Or your biggest suspect could be a cache that you're used to, um, which I'm used to in my service. So I technically look at that piece of the pie and just like erase it from my head and then focus on the other areas. So starting from fresh, we're going to start with the dominator tree, which is this icon with the green tree looking thing. The dominator tree will show you a view of objects and the things they reference. Um, in my example, this instrument handler actually costs like 110 megabytes in my heap. So what you can do with the dominator tree is you can dig through the list of things and eventually expand it into something you own. So thank you for the zoom in. So in my case, the dominator tree points to 110 megabytes are being used by the workshop resource. Um, the package we use for the workshop is C Chesser, which is Carl's last name, who created the service. So everything in our domain is C Chesser. Um, so I can check it out. And once again, all right, so there's my clever cache. And I have a search object. Well, the clever cache is big, but that's fine. Like we're performing great, like zero errors, no big deal. So the dominator tree will help you identify the pieces, the big pieces of the puzzle. So if I were to get rid of the workshop resource, I free 110 megabytes in my heap, but then I'm also not serving any traffic because I got rid of the main thing. 
but you can use this to find um, areas that you are wasting memory and what is holding on to it. Now, the next area I'm going to go to will be the histogram. The histogram will show you a set of all the classes and how much memory they take. This is very reminiscent of that uh, J overflow panel on the bottom. So a lot of these tools will give you a lot of the info. Yeah, there's all my classes. So once again, we have about 2.7 million instances of a search result element. And it takes about 80 megabytes in the heap. So a nice thing about the histogram is you can um, see what points to those instances and see what those instances point to. So Eclipsemat has a concept of incoming and outgoing references. And you and I always think about it as incoming to like what points to me and outgoing like what am I pointing to. So I could list these objects with incoming references and it'll give me once again a filtered view where the tree is sort of inverted where you have to think about it like as we dig through the UI down, we're actually going like up the hierarchy of things that are pointed to. So in my case, I have this specific search result element instance being pointed to in an object array of 73 items. That's weird. Whatever the thing on the screen. Yeah, the thing on the screen was odd. Um, so object or, oh, I see what Justin was doing. Justin was grabbing the screenshots from the website and they were all matching together until now. Awesome, I went off script. So anyway, um, let me see if I can make this bigger. Come on, Mac. Oh, okay, I can't. Um, so in this case, I have uh, my search result element, which being pointed to a data field in my cache entry object, which is being pointed to by a hash map. So I could dig through exactly what field points to everything. Um, I could also list them by outgoing references, um, and that would show me what the search result element instance points to. So if we had a big object and we had one instance of a big object, we could actually see what it points to. And if we get rid of that, we get rid of everything underneath it. Um, now, the next tab we'll look at is the thread view. The thread view is this weird gear icon. Their icons aren't like the best. And it'll sort of give me a thread dump of the heap as it was at the point where I took the heap dump. A note of caution in the thread view is you will sometimes see if I if something was happening on this thread and I clicked on the stack trace, you would sometimes see the out of memory error in the stack trace of this thread. Now that doesn't always mean that the problem is in what was happening in that thread. You might have a situation where you have two threads, 100 megabytes in your heap. The first thread requests 95 megabytes to load, I don't know, some large GIF. And the other thread tries to load a six megabyte image, goes to load it, gets an allocation failure, and you would see the stack trace on that thread because it couldn't get six megabytes and it could only get five. So don't just look at the threads through the stack trace, look at the out of memory error and say like, oh, this is the problem. Here's where we need to focus our area. Um, a lot of these tools will sometimes give you all that info where you jump to conclusions. So it's always good to test your hypotheses. So the thread view, if anything interesting was happening at the moment um, that the heap dump happened, would give me all the thread locals and I can inspect them and you can see values. Um, the heap dump will have a whole bunch of info. If you connect to a database, you can find the connection string and the passwords. So be careful when you're sharing these around. Um, so the thread view is like a quick overview. And you could sometimes see if a thread has a lot of memory, you can see what's happening in that thread by digging through the thread view and see exactly like what chunk of code. Like if I owned the thread pool, I could see like, oh, the specific method await nanos is where we blocked. Um, and the last bit about Eclipse map that I like to look at is OQL. OQL is object query language. Um, not all OQL is created equal. Eclipse Map has its own flavor of OQL, and Visual VM, which we'll look at later, has its own flavor of OQL. The neat thing about an Eclipse Map's OQL is you can just do kind of like SQL, select so star from, and if my 
clips ought to complete it, I could just go through this pane and let me look at all my conference sessions. In order to run a query in OQL, you have to hit this very non-intuitive warning icon. Yep, that one. Um, I believe looking at the sources from the last time I did it, the warning icon was kept as a, this actually will execute a query on the memory model and you might get way more data than you expected. And it might sometimes uh, force the UI to halt or you'll see it um, go down into the um, like progress bar and just like halt. So um, when I'm doing this sort of thing, I like to actually open two tabs. So I'll just do this one. So this view will once again, let me expand it. So now I can see the properties of my conference sessions. So what we can do with OQL is we can actually access these properties and end up writing reports or queries to identify potentially problematic spots. So the first step you can do that is I like to just alias the, um, the object. And since I'm not using star, which is a special identifier, I no longer get the expanding, which is why I have two tabs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the title of all of these conferences and um, it'll give me a string. So since you're dealing with the memory representation of things, um, Eclipse Mod is not super nice about it. So I'm just gonna have to call it two string on it. And now I can get the values. And if I wanted to spend enough time, I could end up writing a complex thing where I look at the values and the tag count. So let's try to do that. So we'll do tags, which is an element data, which is an array, which has a size. So I think if memory serves me right, I can do this, tags, data, and I believe that'll give me an array. And then let's, I can use an internal array has length. Oh, that's why we don't like demo. Um, that's fine, I'll just leave it there. I can also use um, Eclipse's internal memory um, objects, which you access with the add symbol. And I could grab the retained heap size of that specific object. And now I have a pretty nice report of, hey, this object with this title takes this amount of memory. Any questions so far? Cool. So. Quick recap, Eclipse, Matt, a little bit more for like medium level analysis. We're kind of still poking around at areas to look at, but we can use OQL to write a little bit more targeted reports. And when I get to that part, when I'm actually trying to write something super cool, like, hey, here's the tag count breakdown. These objects have this value. This is the most common value. This is the repeated value in this object. That's when I like to move to Visual VM. Um, Visual VM, is a, another tool. It used to come with the JDK and it used to be JVisual VM loaded in the JDK. It eventually got open sourced, got moved to use the NetBeans UI styling and is now um, Visual VM 2. Um, so I'm going to open up my heap dump in Visual VM 2 and Visual VM isn't super nice about putting me in the context where I launch things. So I'm just gonna have to dig through all my workspaces, KC jug, practicing, and here's our keep them. I will let that open up. The first iteration of Visual VM was a little bit less friendly. Um, everything was kind of colorless and very HTML -y text. So they updated it a little bit and it has just four, actually five now, primary views. So the first part I like about the summary view as the show prop, the system properties, to get this info in Eclipse Mat. Currently, it's a little bit annoying because you have to write OQL to get the system properties and then write a query to like print them out. So if I'm looking, like trying to spot check the system properties, I'll open the heap dump in Visual VM. And when I'm doing a heap analysis, I actually will open it in all three tools and I'll be crazy and I'll switch around and like grab info from one and like grab info from the other. So. The next view we have is our objects view. The objects view sort of combines the histogram from Eclipse Mat that we had with the select star part of um, Eclipse Mat, where I could just dig through individual items 
and get fields and look at the values of it. Um, the threads view sort of does the same thing as Eclipse Mat. Like this one's a little bit nicer in the indentation where I could dig through a thread and look at the local variables and see what was happening in there. And the most powerful um, view, I think, for Visual VM is the OQL console. I'm going to bring this up a bunch. So the OQL console in Eclipse Mat was you type at the top, results at the bottom. Visual VM had to switch it up. So type at the bottom, results at the top. Um, you can do um, select star and all that stuff. Um, but I don't think that's the most powerful thing. Um, Visual VM actually comes with a object loaded for you, which is an API to interact with the memory model that Visual VM is using to represent your heap. So what we're going to do now, we're going to grab our same example. We're going to get those conference sessions, and we'll actually like print titles and tags. And we'll do it in JavaScript, which is a little bit easier. So when I start, what I like to do is, hey, let's look at, let's look at those conference session objects. And the easiest way to go about it is, is we just right click copy and we copy the name. And that's how I usually start when I'm looking at things because I don't want to remember the super large class path. I use the objects function. That'll actually search for objects that match all this name. I believe it does wild carding. So I could do um, other functions like data.star and get objects of all that type. But I usually go for a focus of a specific object that I'm looking for. So now that I have my objects, I'm going to send this to a variable. And if I execute the query, nothing happens because I didn't return anything. So we can just return our sessions and they'll get outputted again in the results view. The results view will put these HTML links and they're super nice because you can just click back to it and it gives you a special tab where we can actually look at the fields um, of that object. It's kind of like what I was doing in OQL in Eclipse Mat where I went from one tab to the other. This does it for you because it's really useful to be able to just see the fields. So what we're going to do is the next part I like to do is I want to deal with these objects as JSON. So I'm going to write a function and it's going to call to JSON. It's going to take a session object and we're going to return a JSON object. And what I personally like to do is I'll use a self field that just points to the same object just to get that link back in case I lost it. And then I believe we have a title was the field. We'll do session.title. Now that I have a function to convert them, I'm going to map my sessions to JSON. I did things right and then executed. Now I have JSON objects to deal with, which is much nicer to me than trying to write OQL in Eclipse Map. So now that I have my JSON objects, I'm going to add a couple more fields. So we have tags here. So let's make a tags, just have them. And let's do tag count will be sessions.tags. If it exists, then it, I believe it is in array, which might be where I get this wrong. OK, element data dot size. Oh, it actually has a size field for me. Cool. So otherwise, 0. And if I did everything right, I'll get things with tags and everything oh, there. Hard to see with the colors. There we go. Now we have tags. So um, variable naming is important here. So now that I have my objects mapped to the data that I want, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually filter them out. So we'll say an item that has tags takes a djson object and return d dot tag count grand zero. This might not be the best way of doing tags tag count, but we'll take it. And then I can use a filter function provided by, a custom, by a Visual VM to grab my JSON objects. If I did everything right, I should only get objects with tags. And then if I wanted to be extra special, which thanks Justin is um, showing us that on the screen, I could write a sort function to sort them from tag to bottom. So we can do that. Um, so let's call these um, 
Ag Ag oh, that's a good name. We're going to write sort by count. And the sort function will take two arguments. It's basically a comparator, right? So we're going to do right hand side, left hand side. We're just going to return right hand side dot tag count minus left side dot tag. That usually is a good enough comparator. So now I'm going to sort tagged. Hopefully I did everything correct. Nothing blow up, blew up. Oh. Well, I want to do this backwards because I want to um, invert it. So I'm just going to cheat and replace the variables. And boom, now I have a report of conferences by tag count. I should be able to zoom review on a Mac. Uh, I haven't done this before. If you tell me the command, is it like command Apple key plus? Or just like use the... Hmm, not sure how to do it. So that is um, Visual VM and Visual VM OQL and not shell, which I really like because I can just write crazy reports. And when I'm looking at a heap dump and I'm trying to like prove a point, you can write some really cool looking reports and like send them to your boss and like get extra credit. So any questions before I move on to the next bit? Option, okay, option, command, plus. This is where I'll throw you off, Justin, by telling you that I'm using a Windows keyboard on Mac, so all my settings are inverted. Well, I've never had, I've never run the Mac, so I, I don't know how they do it, but well, there's some way you can do it. Hopefully, at least on your screen, it's big enough. So <laughs> if there are no other questions, we'll move on to, I'll give you the answer. Um, in our workshop online, we have a challenge section, which is, we lied, I've been lying to you all this time. You probably already caught on to it but this um, service has a memory problem. And we'll go back and take a look at that. So let's just go back to Eclipse and go back to the beginning. Which tool do you use the, the most? Um, probably Eclipse Matte for something that is like quick and obvious because Eclipse Matte comes with a whole bunch of reports. Um, at Cerner, I don't know if this will show, yeah. so. At my Cerner work, I actually wrote my own plugin for Eclipse Map plugin to sort of analyze common problems that we have at Cerner. We have our own like caching mechanism. So imagine we're using Caffeine or Hazelcat or EH Cache. It's a plugin that does the same thing that just shows me all the caches in the memory. So um, probably Eclipse Map because most of my problems at Cerner are sort of repeat, like somebody didn't make their cache big enough or their cache is too big and they're like, caching like 2 million objects. So does that answer your question? Hopefully it does. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. We looked at 2.7 million objects, which seems a little bit ridiculous. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna list these objects and see what is pointing to them once again. And we'll drill down, it's an array, it's an element data, the results, data on this entry and a map being pointed by a table, by this inner cache field and the clever cache. All right, now problem of concern, we should only have one cache. So let's confirm that. So I'm gonna use the regex, regex here to just filter on clever cache and few. We only have one, which is good, but my cache is 110 megabytes. So let's inspect it a little bit. So what we can do now in Eclipse, Matt is we can open up the attribute of I list objects with outgoing references. There, now we're looking at our one cache. If I select my cache, I can look at what fields my cache has. And it has an inner cache object, which has an entry set, which has a table, which looks kind of big. Um, so I kind of want to extract values from this cache, which my attributes isn't showing correctly, but that's fine. That's why we have visual VM OQL. So what I want to do now is I want to see, hey, what is the cache configured at? And what, like how many items are in here? So we're going to jump back to Visual VM. We're going to erase all our nice work. We're going to go back to the objects and we're going to open up our clever cache. We have one, 
Visual VM will give me the instance. On the fields, we have a cache limit of 250. And we have a table um, size of 17,238 items in the cache. Does that seem right to anybody? Hopefully not. So um, the memory leak here is our usage of the cache and it being configured correctly, hopefully, or just there's a bug in there. So I'm going to switch over to my browser around the left. Way more. Awesome. So we're going to go, let's go digging into the sources here. I'm going to go to GitHub, which you can see our uh, workshop. And we're gonna, we'll take it from the top. Let's, talk, let's start from the workshop resource class. Which I believe now I can actually zoom in. Uh, browser comes in any. So our workshop resource is a um, JaxRS resource that goes in Drop Wizard. Um, if you're familiar with Drop Wizard, this part will probably um, jump out at you because Drop Wizard tells you the workshop resource is going to be reused by every thread in the application. Don't store state on it. And if you do store state, make it thread safe. So we have our clever cache and we're storing results by context. We get a search result. If nobody's looked it up, we like save it and then we return a context identifier that callers are supposed to use. Um, I probably didn't call it with a context identifier like 90% of the time, which is why I have all these results just cached. So now let's take a little peek at our clever cache. Will this work? Oh man, that's so cool. Awesome. So our cache, um, somebody wrote it, not naming names. Um, it has a limit. We told our map to just take the limit, so it should never exceed that. And when we go store a key, we check if it's full. If it is full, we'll remove the last recently used and we'll put a new entry in the cache. So if we go back to is full, all right, yep, if the cache size is not equal to the limit, we're not full, we keep going. Now, the bug here is when we're in a multi-threaded environment, let's say we have two threads coming in. Third one gets to line 30, we have 249 items in the cache, our limit is 50, our cache is not full, so we jump over, we create a new entry, and right about here, we pause. We're like, all right, hold on. Thread two comes in, evaluates the same condition. Cache is not full. We go back. We finish thread two, put our item in the cache. Our cache limit is now 250. Thread one finishes. The limit or the size of the cache is now 251. And every subsequent thread that comes through afterwards will always be told that it is not full. And it'll consistently put items on the cache. Now the naive approach would just be to like do a greater than and or equal and not worry about threat safety, or we could actually make this um, cache threat safe, or we could use something like guava or caffeine that actually provides uh, threat safe caches. But from just looking at Eclipse map, this memory problem was like kind of suspicious that we had you know so many items in the cache, like 2.7 million. Um, and one instance of our cache, uh, like most of the memory. So that is the memory challenge of the workshop. Um, any questions? Oh, there was a question. Let me scroll, scroll. How do these commands in the remote JVM? So I promise I would get back to you. So one of the ways I know to do them is I'm going to use JDK mission control go off script here. I'm going to, to attach to my um, Java process. Um, you can also do remote stuff through the JMX protocol. So if I attach to my Java process, I can go to the MBean server, which is the management means. Um, open up my MBean browser, and then I could use the Sun Management um, Hotspot Diagnostic Bean and use the dump heap operation to generate a heap dump remotely. Um, it does require that you enable JMX. Um, our website has actually part of the workshop. We'll have you do this in a container just so you can actually deal with a remote thing that's still on your machine, but considered remote in terms of your JDK mission control remote connecting to that machine. And you have to open ports uh, like J or set the JMI and JMX 
properties. And we have all of that on the website. Any other questions before we part? Awesome. All right. The last thing to remember, there's one thing you take away from this is remember this website, all of the content I showed you or tried to show you really minimized will actually be maximized um, as Justin was showing us super nicely. Um, so just remember this website. We've actually done a pretty good job at SEO where if you search for Java Perf Workshop, like our GitHub will show up. So um, with that, um, thank you so much, everybody, for having me. I hope you learned something. Big shout out to our sponsors, CRL, for the stream. And hopefully we'll do this in person um, at the Freight, at YRC's Freight location. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jan. Awesome. All right, guys, I'll see you. Bye, everybody.